In early 1943, the skies over Europe were a chaotic and deadly place. At this time, during the Second World War, the United States had just become situated in England, finally moving enough bombers and crew members to begin daylight bombing raids of Fortress Europe. But this was not the same bombing that took place later in the war, with Mustangs roaring over massive formations of bombers as they pounded German targets undeterred. This was a totally different battlefield. During this period, there were just a handful of men and aircraft ready to fight. The few U.S. Army bomb groups that were present in England could only put up a few units of bombers, which paled in comparison to the 900 to 1,000 that were common just a few years later in 1945. But in addition, at this time, bombing raids had no real fighter escort. Many commanders were still currently under the impression that the heavy bombers would be able to defend themselves alone, but many American lives would be lost before this theory was proven false. But perhaps more threatening than any of those fears was the fact that their adversary was still well-trained, numerous, and hungry for battle. The cost of attrition had not yet begun to reduce Luftwaffe numbers, so their pilots were skilled and there were still plenty to be found in the skies over Germany. This was, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the most treacherous period in history to be in a bomber over Europe. And it is here that our story takes place, with a fight to the death between one of these very bomber crews and a seasoned German ace. A fight that would rock the nation and change the perspective of one of America's most critical aircraft for the remainder of history. If you can believe it, this tale actually begins a couple of years earlier, with one of the most bizarre events in World War II. When Rudolf Hess, one of the top members of the Nazi party, attempted a secret and unauthorized flight in a Messerschmitt ME 110 to England to negotiate with the king. This plan would eventually fail, and he was captured by the British. The blunder would be on the front pages of newspapers around the world, and one of these papers would be the New York Times. And pay attention, because this is where our hero is born. Here, on the front page of the Times of May 13th of 1941, we can see the headline, which, of course, is embellished. Hess, deserting Hitler, flies to Scotland. Berlin reported him missing and insane. Quite a headline, huh? And if we zoom in on the right side of the page here, where I will clip out the continued story, we can see the details of this event. But that isn't the focus of the video. What I want to show you here is this, the name of the reporter that published this story, Robert P. Post. Robert Post was an up-and-comer for the Times, and had been covering the Battle of Britain the past few years from London. But here, this would be his big break. The young journalist was one of the very first to file the story of Hess's secret flight on May 13th of 1941, making the front page of the biggest newspaper in the country. And like a perfect novel, in a touch of dark foreshadowing, we can also see on this same front page an article about the Royal Air Force bombing of the Reich, with the shipyards of Bremen being one of the primary targets. At the time of this publication, Post had no way of knowing that a bombing raid to Bremen would play a major role in his own story. After making the front page of the Times, Post continued to get more coverage opportunities, covering the war in depth from England. Here we can see just a few months later, Post publishes a full-page write-up on the Churchills. Then here, in the fall, he published another full page on the war in the Middle East. And finally, in December, after the United States entered the conflict, he began to cover it with a more personal passion as two of his brothers also joined the war. And while he too wanted to join the conflict himself, the Times had convinced Post that his best service to the country would be made using a typewriter instead of a rifle. So he was instead assigned as one of the top war correspondents, covering the war in England from the American perspective. But Post was not the only young man progressing upwards in his career in 1942. On the other side of Europe, 600 miles away, was a young German pilot by the name of Heinz Nock. 
He had just flown his first combat mission and was beginning to make a name for himself. He had proven to be a skilled flyer and was an adequate combat pilot in his first missions on the eastern front of the war. But around 1942, he was transferred to JG-1, where he would now be fighting the Royal Air Force on the western front. Here he got his first aerial kill later that year with the downing of a Spitfire, and then his second and third shortly after. He was getting quite comfortable in his Messerschmitt ME-109, as he was eventually promoted to squadron commander just before the end of the year. Very soon though, his targets would no longer be RAF fighters, it would instead be the Americans. Back in England throughout 1942, Robert Post was covering the action as best he could, doing all that he could to contribute to the war effort. But in early 1943, he received an invitation. This invitation came courtesy of the 8th Air Force, who had decided that it might be good for public relations and for the war effort to have some journalists get footage and write from an actual bombing mission. So Robert Post, along with seven other prominent journalists of the time, were invited to take part in a bold endeavor, to document and report on what it was like to be a heavy bomber crew member over Europe. This unit of eight men was dubbed the Writing 69th. In early February of 1943, the men of this new unit reported for training, which was a week-long endeavor where they were taught how to deal with high altitude and to bail out if needed, as well as the basic operations of weapons, although they were not allowed to fire them in combat. Here we can see a photo of these well-known reporters training, including a CBS reporter, an Associated Press journalist, and most importantly, Robert Post, standing third from the left. After this training, the Riding 69th was sent to various bomb groups across England. The unit to which Post ended up would be the 44th Bomb Group, what would go on to become one of the most famous units of the war. The aircraft of this unit would be the B-24 Liberator, a reliable heavy bomber that was known for its long range and heavy payload. And while the B-24 was indeed a great aircraft, for whatever reason, all of the other correspondents from the Riding 69th chose to fly aboard B-17s in other air groups, leaving Post as the lone reporter to join a Liberator unit. Upon arriving, Post was warmly welcomed by the group, which had named themselves the Fighting Eight Balls, and was shortly assigned to his own bomber, a B-24 named Maisie. The crew of Maisie was happy to have him on board, as everyone knew that the work that the war correspondents were doing was crucial to the war effort. After all, the footage and writing that these men would get and send back home were often the only way that their loved ones were able to get any real information on how they were doing. It was soon apparent that they would be cleared to actually join the crews for a combat mission any day now, and many of them were no doubt excited to see what real combat would be like. But Robert Post was not one of them. According to two of Robert's close friends, he felt that he was going to die. They tried to reassure him, but he was adamant that he would not be coming back home. News soon came that six of the members of the 69th were cleared to fly and the mission that they would be going on would be a raid to Bremen, Germany, a key strategic target due to its valuable shipyards and U-boat pens. The very same target that we saw on the front page of the Times in 1941. The Germans, however, knew that Bremen was valuable and defended it heavily, not only with anti-aircraft and flak, but also with experienced fighter groups. And if you haven't guessed it, one of these fighter groups was none other than JG-1 and Heinz Noak. As the sun rose on the morning of February 26, 1943, the American heavy bomber groups across England prepared for a mission. This time though, Post and the other reporters joined the crews. Robert Post put on his gear and climbed aboard Maisie, where they soon cranked the engines, took off, and were forming up over the channel. After just a few hours, they were over Belgium and on their way to Bremen. Around this time, German radar had picked up the raid and reported it to Luftwaffe headquarters. And fortunately for this story, I have acquired Heinz Noak's book, 
I Flew for the Führer, which documents his missions as an ME-109 pilot. The following is his entry from this morning, February 26, 1943. What a day. I am feeling just in the mood for a good scrap with a swarm of Americans. The weather is ideal, the sky a clear and cloudless blue. Over Great Yarmouth, everything is quiet as yet. The pilots lie around outside on the tarmac, wrapped up in blankets, enjoying the warmth of the first spring sunshine. I relax beside them, squinting idly up at the sky. The two big loudspeakers blare out dance music. We enjoy the BBC musical programs for German soldiers. When the announcer starts his propaganda, there is ironic laughter and applause. Shut your mouth, man, and get on with the music. Suddenly the music stops. Attention all, attention all. Lieutenant Noak is wanted on the telephone. Division is calling. Fresh enemy concentrations are reported in Mapsecto Dora Dora. So the Yank is getting ready off Great Yarmouth for another raid again. But the time for them to take off is not yet here. The American bombers are not yet in range, and they have to confirm the target so that the fighters can intercept successfully. But in just a few minutes, they will be ordered up, so preparations begin. Up with the 44th Bomb Group, though, a problem was brewing. The primary target of Bremen had a thick cloud cover, and so it was decided that the secondary target was now the new objective. This would be Wilhelmshaven, another crucial dock city in Germany. So the bombers quickly diverted course and set a new target. And right about this moment was the time for the Messerschmitts to take off. At 10.50 hours, we are ordered to stand by. The Yank is off the coast headed for Wilhelmshaven. 10.55 hours, intercept. Canopies close. I turn to watch the others starting. All clear. The 12 aircraft take off together in formation. I turn on the radio and call base. Elba 1 calling Bodo. Elba 1 calling Bodo. Report, Victor. Contact with the ground is good. We climb quickly to 25,000 feet. Base replies, Heavy babies in Anton Keller 8 remain over the airfield. I turn north. Our engines leave heavy vapor trails streaked across the clear blue of the sky. Then I spot the enemy formation ahead. It is an impressive sight. Some 300 heavy bombers are grouped together like a great bunch of grapes shimmering in the sky. I check my guns and adjust the reflector sight. The enemy mass is still several miles away and heading south. I report my observations to base. It will be just like a beehive down there now. I cannot help smiling at the thought of the turmoil. From the perspective of the American bombers, there is no doubt that around this time, someone called out over the radio, seeing black specks against the bright sky, bandits coming right for them. The gunners then made ready and began to pull their machine guns up, with Robert Post riding away, jotting down every note that he could, likely fighting against the shaking of his own hand knowing that this is not going to be a milk run. The enemy is here. We draw closer to the bomber formation. I must have opened throttle unconsciously. I can distinguish the individual enemy aircraft now. Most of them are liberators. They look as if their fat bellies were pregnant with bombs. I pick out one of them as my target. This is where I settle your hash, my friend, I mutter. I shall make a frontal attack. The Yank is focused in my sights. He grows rapidly larger. I reach for the firing buttons on the stick. Tracers come whizzing past my head. They have opened up on me. Fire! I press both buttons, but my aim is poor. I can see only a few hits register on the right wing. I almost scrape his fat belly as I dive past. Then I am caught in the slipstream buffeted about so violently that for a moment I wonder if my tailplane had been shot away. I climb up steeply and break away to the left. Tracers pursue me unpleasantly close. Damn all this metal in the air. On board of Macy, it was clear that this was no longer training. 
the 50 calibers had roared to life, and the sound of gunfire and spent shells echoed across the waste, where Post was likely stationed. A brief pause allowed just a moment to breathe, but the Germans would be back. In a few moments, they would return for a second pass. I come in for a second frontal attack this time, from a little below. As I swing round, I turn my head. Flames are spreading along the bottom of the fuselage. It shears away from the formation in a wide sweep to the right. Maisie has now taken substantial damage and has lost an engine. She no longer can keep up with the rest of the 44th and has to leave the flight. Alone now, she is in serious trouble. Flying with Robert Post as a fellow crew member on board of Maisie was 2nd Lieutenant Wayne Gotka, the navigator for their bomber. From the nose of their B-24, Gotka remembered the attack vividly as well, from the perspective of the American aviators. The following is from a letter he wrote shortly after the war. And our ship was under constant fighter attack from the time we reached the island of Texel until we were shot down. We had fought off the planes with very minor damage until we were almost to Oldenburg, then all hell broke loose. I spent most of my time with position reports trying to get shortcuts filled into the flight to allow us to gain and catch the rest of the formation. When we were almost to Oldenburg, fighters hit us from all sides. Twice more I come into attack, this time diving from above the tail. I am met by defensive fire. My plane shudders under the recoil from the two cannon and 13 millimeter guns. I watch my cannon shell bursts rake along the top of the fuselage and right wing, and I hang on to the stick with both hands. The engineer and top turret operator shot the first fighter down, and I hit the next. However, not until he had sent 20 millimeter cannons into the nose and cockpit. Sergeant Mifflin shot down the third from his waist gun position. At this point, my left gun jammed, and I know at least two planes made direct hits on the nose and flight deck. Someone, I'm sure, was hurt on the flight deck, and I was hit twice in the nose of the ship operating a jammed gun. Engines number three and number four had been hit and were on fire. I believe fire spread to the wing tank and caused the ship to explode. The fire spreads along the right wing, the inside engine stops. Suddenly, the wing breaks off altogether. The body of the stricken monster plunges vertically, spinning into the depths. A long black trail of smoke marks its path downwards. I was working on my guns when all at once it seemed someone pushed me from behind and all went black. I woke up falling through space and pulled my ripcord and no results, so I reached back and tore the back of my chute out my last look at the altimeter showed 26,000 feet, and the Germans claim they saw my chute open at 5,000 feet. One of the crew attempts to bail out, but his parachute is in flames. Poor devil. The body somersaults and falls to the ground like a stone. In a terrific power dive, I follow my victim down and land on a runway below. I run over to the scene of the crash, a crowd of people are there, trying to fight the fire in the farmhouse. I join in the rescue work and bring out furniture, animals and machinery from the burning buildings. Smoke blinds and chokes me. My flying suit is scorched by the flames as I drag a fat pig out by the hind legs, squealing like mad. The farmhouse and barns are saved. Strewn all over a cow field lies the wreckage of the Liberator. The explosion threw clear the crew in midair. Their shattered bodies lie beside the smoking remains of the aircraft. They picked me up after I had sat uh, between two trees about 20 feet in the air for about 25 minutes and took me to a first aid station for treatment of cuts around the head and 20 millimeter wounds. It was here I saw Sergeant Mifflin. As I said, he saw Captain Adams' leather jacket, and it appeared the man had been killed. 
The ship's loading list was removed by the Germans from the jacket. The Germans asked me about Robert Post as they could not identify him from the loading list. Yeah, I gave them no information whatsoever as my orders were. To say nothing in hopes if men were at large, their chances of getting home would be better. At 100 yards away, I find the captain's seat and the nose wheel, a little doll, evidently the mascot, sit undamaged between the shattered windows of the cabin. That was my fourth combat victory on my 164th operational mission. At about 12 p.m. on February 26th of 1943, B-24 Maisie was shot down by German fighters. For more than 30 minutes, her gunners fended off numerous attacks and, according to their own claims, may have shot down multiple of the 109s attacking them. She took substantial damage and fell behind the formation, where she was eventually a sitting duck for the Messerschmitts. It was here that JG-1 squadron leader Heinz Nook finished her off, lighting her right wing on fire, eventually breaking off. Of the crew on board, only two men were able to successfully bail out. Waste Gunner Staff Sergeant James Mifflin and Navigator 2nd Lieutenant Wayne Gorka, both of whom were injured. They would be taken as POWs and would survive the war. Robert Post, however, would be killed as B-24 Maisie went down on the very first mission of the Riding 69th. His premonitions, tragically, had been correct. Of the reporters that went on this mission, Post would be the only one shot down and the only one in a B-24 Liberator. Because of his death, the Riding 69th immediately disbanded and journalists would not be allowed to fly on combat missions for quite some time, as there was no way to conceal or soften the losses of a mainstream reporter from the papers back home. This was simply not a good look for the 8th Air Force. But in addition, because of the plane that he was on board at the time that he was shot down, when reporters and journalists were eventually allowed back in the air and with the bomb groups, they almost always preferred the B-17 units. The consequences of this resulted in a great deal of coverage for the B-17 over Europe and minimal for that of the B-24, which in many ways shaped public perception of these bombers for years and decades to come. Three days later, on Monday, March 1st of 1943, we can see the morning paper, the New York Times. Here we flip the pages, and far from the front page, on 18, we can see a paragraph with the title that only says, Bob Post. It reads, Robert P. Post of the Times was one of six American reporters who rode in the bombers that attacked Wilhelmshaven last Friday. He was in one of the bombers that did not come home. We do not suppose that he or his companions regarded their trip as a special act of courage. They thought of it, we are sure, in terms of helping American readers to understand what our flyers are doing in this war. The risks were incidental, as they have been and are four correspondents covering the fighting in the Solomons, in New Guinea, in North Africa, and in the high seas. The story was the thing on Bob Post's mind. And beyond that, the sense of responsibility to his home public and to his country. He was urged to wait until the bombers went on a less dangerous errand. He insisted on being taken along because, as he undoubtedly reasoned, the more dangerous the errand, the better the story. We on the Times saw him develop from a fledgling into a brilliant journalist. He was not too proud to take a job as an office boy when that position was the only one available and he had the initiative and native ability to seize the wider opportunity when it opened. Last summer, at the age of 31, he wanted to join the army. He was, with difficulty, persuaded that he could do more by remaining in his chosen profession. A veteran of the worst days of the London Blitz, he was in spirit, indeed a soldier. We do not yet know whether he was one of the men seen parachuting from the disabled plane, or whether in some other way his life may have been spared. We do know that he faced danger as part of a duty eagerly assumed. Every member of this newspaper's staff is proud to be associated with such men and hopes for their safety and mourns and misses them when they are taken away. 
from the New York Times, March 1st of 1943. At the end of his journal entry for February 26th of 1943, German ace Heinz Noack closes with perhaps one of the greatest quotes I've ever read. After his experience that day, he writes, I cannot help but thinking about the bodies of the American crew. When will our turn come? Those men share in common with ourselves the great adventure of flying. Separated for the moment by the barrier of war, we shall one day be reunited by death in the air. Despite his best efforts, Heinz Noak would not be reunited by this great death in the air. He went on to survive the war, scoring 33 kills, 19 of which were heavy bombers. He died in 1993 at the age of 72. As for Robert Post, his death was devastating to his family. But unlike many of his fellow crew members, his remains were never positively identified. In this missing air crew report made many years later, we can read that it even mentions that Robert Post's father, Waldron, searched long and hard for confirmation of his son's death after the war, but never found a grave or definitive proof.